So uh, everyone, welcome to this session. Uh, session two, uh, 1D, uh, virtual instructions for students with autism. And thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Ethan Pan. I'm an educational consultant at Patton. And I will be moderating this session and also throughout the day. Um, before we begin, I just have a few quick reminders. Uh, this session is being recorded and the recording will be posted to the Schoology as soon as possible. And due to the size of today's sessions, we have about 249, 250 uh, participants right now. And we ask that all participants keep their microphone and camera disabled unless it is needed. Um, and without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Dr. Amherst de Pluglia. Uh, welcome, Dr. Amherst. Thank you so much, Ethan, for that introduction. And thank you to all of you who are here. It is just, you know, as our director, Angela Kirby, said this morning, it is always so incredibly overwhelming to see how many people are taking time out of their days because they're so concerned about students. So I do hope you find this um, information shared here helpful. Um, for those of you who by chance happen to watch the National Autism Conference session, this is a repeat with a little bit of tweaks of that session. Um, I was asked to do it because there were so many inquiries that came in when the surveys went out. Uh, in desperate plea, basically, from autism support teachers and staff. So hopefully um, this will provide some help to you. So the title is um, Virtual Instruction for Students with Autism, and my hope is to share information with you that may help you guide your processes of assessment, programming, planning, and then execution of your, uh, of your virtual instruction for those students that need so, right, such instruction. So one of the things that we know is that there is some definite possibility. Some of you already know if you're doing virtual instruction. Some of you um, have all virtual instruction going on. We know there's everything from all virtual to all face-to-face -face in some places. But one thing we know for sure is that anything can change at the drop of a dime, right? And um, I had shown this also during my, my other session that this is sort of something that you know everybody back in March when the governor announced that all schools were closed, online classes for everyone, we're going to have to do everything virtual. Who would have thought, right, that we're virtual reality and everything virtual is so in the forefront of our daily lives that our reality would become virtual and that we would have to spend so much time trying to transform, change what we do every day interacting with our students to be able to do things on a virtual platform when we know we're dealing with so many vulnerable students. So, you know, even though some people were all excited about launching this, wow, we can do this and we're doing virtual classes. And even now, you know, which is sort of um, Buzz's face, uh, you see Woody's face. And I would dare say that most of the teachers can actually relate more to Woody and not to Buzz. That even though there may be some students where it may not be as challenging or difficult for you, the reality is that many, many of the students who receive special education, right, that have IEPs under the category of, of autism present some unique challenges that really um, make a lot of us shake in our shoes when we think of how can we make that ideal for them, right? So in an effort to kind of set the stage for my planning of of this session, I went out and I asked some of my teachers, or I took this from information I had already received from some of the teachers that we provide support to. And what are some of the things that are worrying teachers, right? And there were some common themes, like how am I supposed to pull this off with these students? I'm expected to do it, but I have no idea how. I'm concerned my students aren't going to get what they need through this virtual platform. How am I supposed to do this when I have my own kids at home that I'm struggling with and trying to figure things out with, trying to work from home, do virtual instruction, but I have three children of my own. Um, pretty much almost every teacher had this kind of unison feeling. You know, we know it's not administration's fault. We know that 
everybody is just doing what they've been told to do. But the bottom line is, I don't know how to pull this off, right? And they, administration, they may not even be aware of some of the very unique challenges that your students may present. How do you do this virtually with students for whom even in-person instruction may be a challenge in the classroom? So when you think of, right, all of the, all of the um, details that go into planning for effective instruction in a classroom where you have all the supports in place, where you have all the staffing that you need, and now you think of how do I do this when the child's on the other end of a camera, that seemed to be a common theme and still is given some of the challenges that were presented during the spring um, um, school time and as also during the summer months for those teachers that provided ESY. Um, for the learners, all those learners that do need the additional support, which is many learners, then what happens if the parent's not available to help either because they're working or they have, you know, whatever circumstances. And then the most common theme of all, even with the best of the virtual instructors, nothing can replace, right, face-to-face -face instruction. Nothing replaces that ongoing interaction between teachers and students. So, you know, I have Ross here from Friends and you see him and this is kind of like what most teachers feel like, even with all the attempts they try to, you know, do things the way they do in the classroom, there simply is no resemblance. So even though we try to keep it together, I would dare say that most people are still feeling pretty concerned. And bottom line is the following. Um, Todd Whitaker, some of you may be familiar with him because he's very popular in the teaching world. And, you know, he's an inspirational speaker and he's all about effective instruction and all about, you know, promoting things that make teachers great teachers. And one of my favorite quotes of his is the following, you know, the best thing about being a teacher is that it matters. The hardest thing about being a teacher is that it matters every day. And so when we look at this population of children, you know, individuals, some of them young adults who are so incredibly vulnerable, and yet for every teacher, right, every moment matters. Imagine then how much more it matters in the case of these children that then have other conditions, other circumstances that make things so much more difficult. So I know there were a lot of teachers out there just so incredibly burdened, heartbroken, um, by knowing the situation that their students face. So knowing how much instruction matters, then the goal of this session is to provide that specifically, to provide you with hopefully some guidelines, some things you know, that you can consider and think about that may eventually right, lead to some virtual instruction that may be more meaningful, more successful in terms of outcomes for your learners. So, one of the things that many, if not all of you, were faced with back in March, right, that second week in March when it was announced that all schools had to close and everyone had to provide um, virtual instruction instead, is that we were all sort of, oh my goodness, how do we do this? We can't do this. We don't know how to do this. And of course, as teachers, you know, who provide special education services, everybody just rises to the occasion because we have to do what we have to do. And when it did happen in March, one of the things that, that occurred is, well, we were caught off guard, so nobody was prepared. And quickly, everyone scrambled, right, to try to get things done quickly, to try to say, how, do I, how am I going to train these parents? What am I going to do to get this student to respond to a computer, et cetera? So we were unprepared, and therefore, it left us sort of chasing, right, behind the successful virtual instruction. So I wanted to share with you this Chinese proverb because it's so meaningful and ties so well into what we have today, right? We know that the best time to plant a tree was yesterday, but the next best time is now. So it's the same thing here. We know that ideally we would have been prepared to know what to do back in March, but now, right, we couldn't be prepared back then. But now that we know virtual instruction is happening, and in some cases may happen because things can change even in districts that have you know, elected options like hybrid or in person, we never know what's going to happen. Then how do we do things differently so we can't plant things right in the best manner possible now that we know we have the opportunity. So the goal is to be able to assist you primarily with the most challenging learners, right? The ones where 
we have difficulty getting responses from them sometimes even in the classroom but we'll address all learners not only you know learners who are very early learners but also the whole gamut to the best of our ability in the time that we have so what do we know and in terms of uh, how this session is going to be panned out because it's three different segments right for three different hour-long sessions is this first segment is going to primarily address everything that will hopefully help you have better planning even if there's only a few days of school left if some of the things on here you haven't considered yet then it might be something that you want to go back and consider and plan for so this the first segment is going to be all about assessment pieces what are all the considerations what are all the things you want to check prior to even beginning then the second segment will go over some considerations possible modifications specificities that we may need to do differently during virtual instruction and then the last segment will go ahead and show you some specific examples of instruction across different levels of learners and then you know talk about why some of the modifications were made and what unique uh, differences occur during those sessions and how they panned out so what do we all know about effective instruction no matter what right doesn't matter what we're teaching what population we're teaching special education or not instruction is instruction and as such our starting point should always be assessment right many of you are already familiar with your learners you may have already assessed them when they were in school problem is that assessing and intervening when you're dealing with a learner who's at the other end in a home environment then the assessments that we do in school are insufficient. There are so many other factors that we need to consider to inform us in terms of planning and programming for a session that we're delivering virtually as opposed to in person. So first thing that we need to consider would be instructional level of the student. But there are some things that I do want to point out to you because one of the assumptions is that learners with less skills will be less likely to respond to a virtual environment and learners who have more skills maybe conversational skills will be more likely so yes it is important to learn to know what instructional level your child is at right that's important no matter what so whether they're an early learner we refer to early learners as those students who have very little to no language who require a lot dense you know all direct instruction to be able to learn and acquire skills our intermediate learners are those that may have already acquired some basic language skills but still require majority of direct instruction also to be taught and are still developing some of those critical language skills that are going to lead to allowing them to access right other more complex materials and then our advanced learners are our learners just to have an easy summary of what these are who are those students who are able even to answer some questions, engage in conversation maybe, but still may have some gaps, right, within some social communicative needs or, or behavior needs, whatever it may be. You know, even if it's problem behavior, I'll address that in segment two and part two. It's still generally, I mean, I would say 99 and not 100% of the time due to some skill deficit, right? If we if we are engaging in problem behaviors because we're lacking some kind of coping skill or some other skill that we could engage in instead. So regardless of the level learner, there's more than just, you know, can they talk or can they not talk? Because what did we find throughout our experience of the past several months? That there were some early learners that actually wound up responding great to virtual instruction simply because maybe they found it extremely fun and, and, and were sort of you know, blown away by the fact that their teacher was on a screen and screens are things that are valuable to them. And so they wound up responding better, whereas some students who actually have a skill set that's pretty complex, it took weeks to be able to get them to just respond to a teacher on a camera. So, the language level or instructional level of your student will not always tell you whether they will succeed on a virtual platform, even though, of course, we would have more concern about the students who have less skills, right? 
So as far as your student assessment, what are the things that we need to know about the student, right? There's going to be several levels of assessment here. So in regards specifically to your student, what are the things you need to know? Well, first of all, what's their ability to respond to the technology? Can they respond on their own, as you see here, independently? Or will they require some level of support? And we would want to know if they require support, then what type of support and to what extent do they need support, okay? So if we're determining, for example, that the student um, requires support, then it's going to lead to some questions that I'll go over when I go over the family assessment. However, it is important for you to know, can the student respond independently to the, to the virtual platform, whether it's to a live teacher, remember, or it's to some asynchronous, um, not live, pre-recorded um, activity that the student needs to respond to. Next would be to do an assessment of what the student's current reinforcement schedule looks like. So for example, you may have a student that at school may have already been at a point where you could provide you know, an instructional session, have them respond to many things before you had to actually reinforce them, but now that they're at home and that you don't have them in front of you. So a lot of those things that you established that was responding to the teachers and the paraprofessionals, the SLPs, the OTs, whoever was interacting with them, responding to them in person, we established ourselves, right, the, the adults, as the source of when you respond to me, good things happen. But it turns out now you're not there. So there may be a whole new set of circumstances that may require having to adjust, right, that schedule of reinforcement. In addition to that, if you had students that, for example, you were providing a lot of social reinforcers, such as tickles and high fives and hugs and things that were physical, social kind of reinforcers, right, scratching the head, like all those fun things, now you can't do that anymore. And you may lose a lot of potential reinforcers that you may have identified in the classroom. So another thing you have to consider in assessment is what are then the current existing reinforcers? And if you don't have enough identified, there may be the need right, to have to condition or make other things valuable. Otherwise, you're going to sort of run out of options because if you're using the same thing over and over again and all you have um, to your advantage as far as reinforcers might be showing them a video virtually, then it may lose value quickly if you're doing the same thing over and over again, right? So the other um, pieces, do we need someone to deliver the reinforcement for the student or is the student able to manage their own reinforcement? So are they able to access reinforcement with you saying, okay, like whether it's a token economy system or direct reinforcement, will they be able to self-manage where if the teacher says, give yourself a token or go ahead and take a chip or go ahead and start the movie or let me show you the movie that the student's going to be able to do that on their own, access the reinforcer on their, their own without intervention from someone else in the home. And then the other piece that is so incredibly critical is does the student have free access to reinforcement in the home environment or is there control of these reinforcers? Meaning to say, in the school environment, I'll give some examples. You may be using some snacks as reinforcement, some edibles, you may be using um, an iPad or an iPod or anything of that sort or a computer to give the student a few seconds worth of a video or a song, for example, or to play a game, et cetera. And because in the classroom, you have control of reinforcers, at least if you're using reinforcement the right way, students aren't getting a lot of free access to reinforcement. But now, what if you're in a situation where the student at home has constant and free access to going to the refrigerator or the pantry, getting whatever snacks they, they would like to have, and or have free access to that iPad all day long? Now, how do we expect that reinforcement to be valuable if they have it for free all the time and now we expect them to engage in responses and engage in effort to get less of it during an instructional session? So these are things that are important, whether we're teaching 
in the home or in school, right? We have to have control of our reinforcers. And when we don't have this, it could pose a potential problem because now we may be in the, um, in the confound of now we get problem behavior during virtual instruction because reinforcement is more limited when you're actually asking them to respond to you. So that's a critical consideration. And then we'll talk about how to address that with the family. So other things that are going to be uh, critical is going to be assessing whether the student has any problem behavior, right? Of course, addressing the most critical, significant problem behaviors when you're instructing in the home, some of the things that you may address in a school environment may not be the priority when it's already so difficult, right? So for example, does the student have aggression towards other self-injurious behavior, right? Do they hurt themselves? Do they engage in any behaviors that cause harm to themselves or others? Elopement is a critical one, right? If students, for example, one, instruction-wise, are they constantly getting up and leaving the area of instruction? Will they not stay in front of the computer if you're providing virtual instruction? But then safety-wise, if the parent and you asking, you know, does the student run away from, when does your child run away from you when um, you're outside, for example? Because as we think about families who are home, for whatever reason, you know, whether the district selected virtual instruction for everyone because that's what they determined or the parents were given a choice and they selected it for whatever reason, right? If this is a family that is dealing with a child who elopes from them, who runs away from them in public places, or if they leave the door open in their house, then that should be a priority to help the family with that. And in general, for the sake of this individual's safety, life long-wise, it would be important to address. Now, as far as the self-stimulatory type of behaviors, meaning things that the child does generally because it makes them feel good, right? Because So some children will do something like line up cars over and over because they like to see the, the cars line up or they might um, constantly play with carpet fuzz, whatever it may be, or rock or play with their hands or whatever it is. Here's the advice we're going to give you do an assessment and then determine if that's a priority to address because with all that you have to put into successful virtual instruction sessions, this may not be the time to address some of those behaviors that we may have addressed more in a school setting, but if they're not impeding the students responding to your virtual instruction, if they are not of significant concern because they're not a danger to the child. So we know that some of these behaviors may be dangerous, because for example, the child might ingest things that are non-edible but are dangerous, right? So if they're mouthing things that aren't dangerous at all, it might not even be that big of a deal. But if the child is mouthing things and they're mouthing all sorts of things, then think of the risk this poses, especially during these times when you are looking at safe behaviors, right? You have a child who takes everything to their mouth now they're at more risk of getting sick, et cetera, right? So those are the kinds of things that we may think about depending on if the student is coming to school some days, you know, those are behaviors that we want to address immediately versus a student who's staying home all the time. It may not be something to immediately address. So you could see how it varies depending on the child. So in addition to that, once you have the student's basic information and all the information you need, and of course, I'm not including in here assessment as far as their, um, their skill levels, because that you would know, with the exception that before I move on to the family assessment, if you have a new incoming student, now the question becomes, how can you assess them? So some things to think about are the following. How are you going to even begin to assess a child virtually if you can't get them to respond to a computer? So some things I know some of the districts are doing, so it may be you know, considerations for you, is that even if they're doing virtual instruction, they're arranging for safely, of course, bringing a child in when there's no one else around you know, to a safe place where they won't have contact with anybody else, where of course teachers taking all the safety measures as well as the child, and then doing some hands-on um, 
in classroom assessment to get a good idea of where this child is at. But it's something you have to think about because you may not realistically, especially with you know incoming kindergartners, for example, be able to get enough information to inform you as far as what you need to program for or what you need to um, um, teach or assess, what you're able even to get out of that. But then once we have sort of all the child information, then we want to go to the family and assess you know, some of those critical aspects that I'm sure already some of you encountered where, okay, I have to schedule a session with each of my students every day. I have to make sure I do this much time. And now you go and the parent doesn't even log on. And even though we may be thinking, look, they didn't even log on to the session. How am I supposed to teach these kids if the parents don't remember to log on? Well, before we would say things like that, first we have to consider what are the family conditions? Is the parent not logging on because they don't want to or because they're at their wit's end and the circumstances in their household don't allow for it? So what are some of the questions you wanna know ahead of time? Parents and or caregivers, right, that are working outside of the home. You want to know that information because it's going to have an impact. Let's say the child is at home but is with a caregiver or babysitter or somebody who can't then assist them or who the child doesn't respond in the same way, et cetera, then you might not be, you know, you have some other compounds to deal with and to plan for, and you might not be able to be as successful from the start, and you would have to plan for that. Um, single parents, right? Parents that are home, or even if they're not single, the spouse, right? The, the, let's say the father or the wife are, or mom is out all day and there's only one parent in the house, that poses a little more burden, more stressors for that um, family member because they're by themselves all day. And I am positive that there were many teachers out there who experienced both trying to work and manage their children and they were by themselves at home for whatever reason it was. We know how difficult it is, so being sensitive to that is important. Then also, are there other children in the home? And then not only are there other children in the home, but it's going to make a difference depending on how many children, what are the ages of the children, the younger the children, or if there's more than one child with special needs, children who have special needs or children who are younger are obviously going to make it more difficult for parents because they're not engaged in independent activities as easily, at least not as likely as if you have children who don't have special needs or you have you know, older siblings that are already independent, right? So that's another factor that's important for you to know because these are things that we have to help parents plan through if we're intending for this to be successful. And then any other needs or stressors the family may have, because again, the more burden a family has, we know there's still people that aren't back to work. There's people going through financial hardship. There's people who are going through family illnesses through you know, a parent that may have their elderly parent in a, in a nursing home and they're concerned about them. So there's all these issues, not to mention already, you know, the population we have that suffer from depression, anxiety, you know, other mental health illnesses, that if we don't take these things into consideration, you're just focused on the student. But if we're not concerned about these things, don't forget you're in the home now. And so every little thing you ask that parent to do, even if it's, you have to, you know, make sure your child is on the computer at this time, even if they're independent, anything you add is going to add more to that burden. So the more we know, the more we can help them um, be successful as well. So the other important consideration as far as um, the family assessment is going to be the um, availability of the family, right? So this is going to be a must for any child who cannot engage independently in the instruction and or who can't self-manage, right? Who can't access their own reinforcement when it's time, who can't manage their own behavior because they're going to need some assistance then. So in this assessment, you wanna look beyond the parents also. Is there anyone else in the house household that may potentially assist? So there were several cases where the parent may not have been available because they had to care for an infant, but an older sibling was available to be able to assist, you know, so depending, or a babysitter was available. So just make sure that in this assessment, you're not just asking the parent, are you available to help your child? But rather, you know, if they're not, let's say they're not, then we would go to the second question, 
is there anyone else in the household who would be available that can help or anybody who would be able to come over and assist if you would need that. So then you have, in terms of availability, all sorts of different levels because you may have a parent who may respond to you and say, well, I'm available, but only during these times. I work from this time to this time, so it would never um, work for us to, to log on at those times. Um, so we would wanna know what's the level of, of their availability and the time of their availability. So can they provide support for the full session and be there the whole time the student is on, provide reinforcement? Are they available enough that even though they might be engaged in something else, they could at least be in proximity and then assist when needed, provide reinforcement and as needed, redirect the student as needed, right? So those are things that you wanna find out. Can they assist with time management? There are learners out there that will engage with the teacher by themselves. They are you know, the learners who have more skills and ability to respond to a teacher independently. However, they won't log on at the time they're supposed to. They won't stay there. You know, so helping with those kinds of issues, being able to prep the, 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 their own child, the student, for, you know, don't forget to log on here, maybe setting an alarm for the child, you know, whatever would work to help and make sure that the child successfully logs on to the session, the student. And then for parents who aren't available, are there times that even if there's not a fixed time that you may log on, that they might have some flexibility and maybe you know, on a weekly basis or two days ahead of time, they say, look, this day at this time, I'm going to be available. So there's a lot of people who have complex schedules and their availability varies greatly. So they might not be able to commit to a specific time of day, but there may be an agreement to just let me know in advance and then, you know, you might be able to accommodate accordingly based on the availability of the parents, right? So that would be something to find out as well. And then what are, this is such a critical piece, what are the training needs of the family? Because, you know, you think about what a curveball this has been, even for teachers. I think even teachers have learned to appreciate teachers more when they had their own children at home that they had to engage and manage their behavior and everything else and work all at the same time. And even teachers who are trained, I mean, I spoke to several people that still struggled with things at home and needed, you know, some support for things. So then imagine the families that don't have formal training. I know many of you do phenomenal jobs at providing training to your family members and communicating, you know, meaningful information. But now you're talking a whole other can of worms. And, you know, a child at home who's home all the time now the family may think all is good because they're not having problem behavior. And as long as we're not having problem behavior, all is fine and dandy. But from the standpoint of a teacher, from the educational standpoint, even if in the beginning our main concern is just getting the student, which I'll talk about more in depth, to approach the computer, to answer to a computer, to be able to respond, and we may be making things really fun for them in the beginning. The ultimate goal is to teach. And if we're not teaching skills, if they're not learning new skills, then that's not doing great, guys. So make sure that you're providing and prepping the parents for the information they need to successfully manage, assist their child, follow through at home, support the instruction, whatever it is that you're going to need on the part of the parent, make sure that you're giving them the information they need then to be able to um, train them. So what are some of the common topics that you may want to consider? Well, training them on reinforcement, um, issues related to motivation, like when the student isn't, doesn't find valuable coming to the computer or responding or even has limited reinforcers. How do you accomplish then getting them, right, to be able to condition the computer, condition um, establishing the teacher as, look, when you respond to your teacher, good things happen, better things happen. And in many cases, even the family, you know, there are families that struggle, that they can't get their children to do things. They're unable to do that. So how do you go about training parents in simple ways that they're able to execute these things successfully? Because 
there is nothing worse than feeling defeated as a parent. And I'm sure at least some of you can relate, okay? I know there's some questions coming in in the chat box. I wanna let you know that at the end of each segment, it's part of the reason I wanted to do this live versus pre-recorded. I am going to allow time for questions and anybody who needs a break can take a break, but we're going to have um, live Q&A, okay? So I'll address them at the end of each segment just so that we stay in time and have plenty of times for questions at the end of each of these topics. So other things that become critical when children are at home, right? If the child has programs where they still need prompting, depending on the program, example, if the child needs any kind of physical guidance as prompts, you're not going to, going to be able to do that via a computer. So parents are going to have to become aware of how to prompt and how to feed prompts, right? Even if in the beginning, those processes are guided totally by you. In addition to that, even, you know, aside from their virtual session for the parents to engage their children all day and keep them, you know, actively participating in the activities at home and keeping them out of trouble, they're going to still need to learn these things and that's how they're going to wind up being more successful. And then also helping them stay engaged and helping them structure the child's day. So I'll talk more about this in terms of scheduling because I feel that sometimes people are not necessarily realistic as far as the expectations they're putting on parents, that there are parents where it is simply impossible because of their circumstances at home to tell them every day at this time, you're going to do this. And then at this time, you're going to do this. So these are things that we have to be aware of what the family circumstances are. This is why it's so important so that then we can address it accordingly. And of course, minimizing problem behavior, right? Whether it's at school or home, as instructors, we are just as concerned about the safety and well-being of children as we are about their learning new skills. They go hand in hand. It doesn't matter if you taught a child how to read if they're engaging in responses that are going to endanger their life because it's not going to go over well in their future if they're running out into the street and getting hit by a car, what good would it have been to have taught them to read. So that should be something everybody takes very seriously and it does present some extra confounds when it comes to the home environment, which we will address. And then the big whopper is, you know, it's not only parents, like we have run many virtual sessions that include, you know, paraprofessional staff, different teachers, and not everybody is tech savvy. And this has caught, right, we've all had to like get, as I say, emergency cert on virtual platforms, right? Learn how to use all these different platforms, all the different add-ons that we can use with Google or with Zoom, or, you know, what are the things that, that we can use to enhance things? So imagine parents who never used a computer, who aren't the, you know, the Instagrammers and the tweeters and the Facebookers, and there are people who don't use any kind of social media, they don't use smartphones, they don't log on to computers. So think of the technology assessments that parents need, which even though this may seem as a shocker to you, some of the parents that you maybe never heard of is because they were terrified because they don't even know how to access the internet. They wouldn't know how to do that. So just keep those things in mind and think both technology um, training wise, as well as the whatever virtual platforms you're using, whether it's to teach such as Zoom or Google Meet or, or Microsoft Teams, it doesn't matter what platform you're using, is the parent familiar with it? And then another thing that's really become popular over the years is the use of these apps or virtual platforms for communication, right? So if you have a Google Classroom or you're using Seesaw or you're using Class Dojo to communicate, send things to your parents to post things, do parents even have a clue how to install an app? So I know it sounds like, what? How could that be possible? When you're tech savvy, it's kind of hard to Think of the time when we were still, some of you may be too young for this, but when we were still using pagers and that was like the biggest wow of technology and forget pagers, I still remember using pay phones, you know, so for many people who were sort of grandfathered into this high tech world, they may have not necessarily had the need to use technology up to now. So that's a super critical consideration. Then you have 
in terms of technology assessment for everyone. This isn't just about the parents. I cannot begin to tell you the teachers that, you know, we're in tears because, okay, I'm all ready to go. I'm going to use Zoom and then their internet was weak. So think on all parts. So from the school, I had a, school, a teacher recently who was doing virtual instruction all spring and summer and went into school and tried to run a session on the day she went to set up her classroom and the internet connection in her classroom was horrendous. I know there are many of you who, to be able to make an emergency phone call from your classroom, you have to go stand by the window or walk down the hall. So just to make sure that you're addressing these things, what device is there available both for the student as well as for the teacher? In terms of the parents, are the devices at home shared? If the computer the child is using is the same one the parent uses for work and they need to be at work and need to be on their computers and it's going to pose limitations, right? Or if there's one computer home and there's siblings that are sharing it. So make sure you're finding these things out so that you can, um, if anything, help the parents with resources if needed, right? Are the devices they're using stationary or mobile? Why is that important? Well, if you think about it, if you're helping a parent with how to teach their child, for example, activities of daily living, like how to do things independently, anything from washing their hands to folding their clothes to making their bed, whatever it may be, or dealing with problem behavior or how to engage their child in everyday activities, then sitting in front of a computer may not be as helpful as opposed to if the parent has some kind of device that's mobile, you can actually follow that parent around, right? You can say, okay, can you flip your camera so I can watch your child while they're doing X? So it allows for a lot more flexibility if they have a device that's mobile. And in many instances, it's good to have both because if the teacher is actually running an instructional session, then having a device that's stationary may be fine, but if it's more guiding the parent or running a session that may be embedded into some activity the parent's doing, then a stationary device isn't going to help if the computer's in the family room or the parent's office or in the bedroom and then the activity's going on in the kitchen, right? Um, the other one that came as a surprise to so many is audiovisual capabilities. So keep in mind that parents need to explicitly be aware as well as on the teacher and school end that devices that are being used to teach, right? Teaching involves students and teachers interacting with each other. So it has to go both ways. Therefore, you're worried about them having video capability and audio capability, meaning do they have speakers and do they have video capability where they can see the teacher and they can hear the teacher. But then it doesn't end there because also if the student responds and now they don't have a camera available or they don't have a microphone available, then the teacher won't be able to hear their responses if their device does not allow for that, okay? And then you also have internet issues, which I know, you know, there were internet companies, there were school dis districts who rose to the occasion. I know that in their planning processes, a lot of the districts are addressing this, but just make sure you don't assume things, don't take things for granted. Ask them, you know, what's your internet like? What, you know, when you watch something on the internet, do, you know, a test, like see, if you watch something, do you see the video clearly or do you see it choppy? You know, there's so many things that can potentially interfere with what you are doing that knowing this ahead of time is critical, right? And I already mentioned the familiarity and knowledge base of the platform. This is not just for parents. Like I said, I don't think I was on my own when I was like Googling, you know, everywhere and looking on YouTube for features of Zoom and features of Google Slide and features of Boom Cards and everything else and its mother that we could find to help us. So, you know, some people are more savvy even in that world of Googling and finding out, and some people are going to be able to quickly um, learn something new. Others are going to need practice. So if you don't know what the baseline is of the family or even yourself, you know, we have to be aware of what our deficits are. And if we're not super savvy on technology, then testing these things ahead of time and knowing them ahead of time is definitely going to help you, okay? So other things that are important is we can't forget about you meaning the teachers, whether you're here as a, 
as a classroom teacher, as a as a support staff, as a um, as a um, related services provider, it doesn't matter. Your home conditions are just as critical as the teachers. I know that in some schools there are um, there are already plans that even if the children are getting virtual instruction, the teachers are going to go to the school, school buildings and do it from there. But if not, there are others. It's not everyone who's doing that. So if you're going to be doing it from your own home, then what are your own conditions? And even, you know, plan ahead. Don't let it creep up. I mean, I know we're at, at this point days or just a few weeks away from school opening for most people. And so, you know, do you have, if you're at home, children at home, are you a single parent? Is there another per parent? So the same things we worry about asking our teachers, we wanna worry about asking for ourselves, right? If we have to go in in the school, who's your child gonna stay with? Who's going to help your child access the instruction if they're doing virtual, et cetera? And then of course, leaving available time for planning versus instruction. Um, one of the downfalls of virtual instruction, I don't know about the rest of you, but it takes a lot more planning and preparation than, um, than your face-to-face -face instruction and a lot of modification of materials that we're going to go over. So make sure you um, account for that as well, okay? And then other things that are going to be important is taking into consideration the home invasion. That's what I call it. You know, it's like home invasion. Even for those of us who are in the professional field, it's well, now everybody has to be dressed to the, you know, you can't be walking around in your pajamas necessarily. You know, maybe at home, your child was walking around always in their underwear. Now there's other people accessing, you know, the home through a camera that may not be feasible anymore. So there's all these um, sensitive issues, right, that we have to keep in mind in terms of confidentiality, privacy issues, and even that sensitivity that we're going to be invading the home, even if we're not there in person, that even if it's via a camera, you are accessing, somebody, accessing sorry, somebody's home environment. So if that is the case, make sure you are talking to parents and caregivers. You're walking them through what to expect, what it's going to be like. You may have to obtain you know, specific permissions. Personally, you know, I would tell you, I think almost everybody would, even if not required, make sure the parent is aware and agrees to and gives you consent to, you know, provide training in the home for the individual instruction to occur. Make sure they're aware of, you know, when I'm in the camp with you on instruction, it means that anything behind your child, I'm able to see so that they know, you know, some people, I know you assume a lot of things, but the thing is some people know so little about technology. Let me tell you, I've seen a lot of snafus on video of people who, because they're seeing you on the screen, because maybe they have you on speaker view, they don't realize that the speaker can see you because they don't have speaker view and they're able to see everybody who's on the camera. So just make sure parents are aware. And especially when you're looking at group instruction, so students, if you're doing, whether it's small group, large group instruction, that parents realize there's going to be other students, which means there's camera access, right? from other homes possibly. So those are things that you would wanna consider and say, well, do we need to, for example, um, make sure that all parents know that they should turn um, their camera off when another student is, is engaged in instruction or they should set up their camera where they can't see anything else in the home, those kind of things. But make sure you have permission from parents because others are going to be accessing their own child's information, right? Or, or you know, their home. And then the other thing that may be applicable to some of you for schools who are doing virtual instruction or part virtual instruction, if you have coaches, for example, in school, or you have consultants such as sites that receive support from us, it's a very different ballgame for, for a parent to feel comfortable with a consultant going into the classroom and helping out a teacher and helping their child than now having another person on camera who's also engaged in the home invasion, right? I know I'm joking with that because of course we're all doing it because we care, but bottom line is some people are, you know, very shy, very, they may need to work through this. They may need to um, feel, right, uh, comfortable enough. And that may be the initial investment is just making them feel comfortable enough and helping them see that this is all for their own good and their child's um, well-being. 
And the other piece is the following, that I know there are um, a lot of places that are giving the parents the option, right? And many parents are selecting the virtual option, but they may not realize what that means. And why I say this is because in the spring, for example, met all districts and I use were giving the option of selecting a plan of whether they were going to do planned instruction or just enrichment, synchronous, asynchronous. But now that this is, you know, long going, there is no, you can just send activities to the home for their engagement and entertainment and try to make them as meaningful as possible. It's we have to teach. So there may have been parents that the teacher just did a touch base with them and called them once a week or got on FaceTime with them. But if they're unable to teach the child, then virtual instruction may not, I mean, how do we do this if the parent is only available once a week? These are considerations we need to have because then that means we're not going to be able to access the student or you're not going to be able to access them, right? So make sure the parents understand what it means to be receiving virtual instruction. I don't know that all parents have that clear and I've already spoken to some teachers who, for example, the parent had elected virtual, but when they got the call from the teacher and, you know, you remember how this and this happened, here's the difference of what it's going to be like in the classroom. And of course, it's, it would be up to the parent anyway if parents are given the option. However, the parent changed their mind when they realized there's no way, because I already saw what happened, that my child is going to get the same level of instruction at home than at school. And, you know, some parents have changed their mind and opted to send their child into school when it's an option. So um, the last part of this section that I want to share with you is the following. Um, we had created this continuity of education tool that's available on the patent website. I actually have the link for you in part two, so, and you have it in your handouts. But um, if you haven't accessed it, it's there for you. The only thing is that we modified it a little bit because like I said, now in all plans, we have to be focused on education, right? On, on, on actively teaching the students, not just sending activities, things like that. Yes, instruction can include also activities for practice, but activities for practice are meaningless if we haven't taught the student what to do and many students aren't able to access things on their own, right? So we have to be really careful with what we're doing. So what this is, as you see in front of your screen, what you have here is the following, that um, for, it just helps you as a planning tool in terms of um, how could you go about walking through everything that we just reviewed, right? So we're going to go over then all of the details of how you then plan for this. But bottom line is, how do you go about? So if we, um, let me just get this so you can see it better. So from the considerations of how are you going to contact the family? Like what's, what are you going to be your means of communication? What are the household circumstances? So this just gives you each question and then um, each of the topics and then what are some guiding questions that you could use and some considerations? So, you know, some of the things we discussed, household circumstances, are you currently working? And then decision-making would go here. This is where you would jot down your notes based on what the parent responded, right? And then there's just some considerations for you to take place. So all this is, is basically a working document. So here is What's the priority focus going to be? I'm going to talk a lot about that in section two. As far as instructional priority, what you were selecting to teach in the classroom may vary in priority if you're teaching in the home environment, okay? So um, all of the questions related to device, time availability, right? Internet access, audiovisual access, um, as you see, all those um, questions are addressed here. So this could serve as your planning tool. Student considerations, we talked about the teacher consideration, specific session considerations. I am going to address the synchronous versus asynchronous and individual versus um, group and what happens when it's teacher delivered versus you're guiding the parent because the child requires direct prompting from someone live. So there's all different um, things to ask and that will help you in determining then what that virtual instruction is going to look like.
okay? So what happens then after you have all your information on assessment? Well, you know, we all know that every, you know, everybody's in, a, in an uproar because of the recent information that came out that all students must wear masks at all times in schools, et cetera. So we know we need, right, personal protective equipment for everyone and that that's important to keep everyone safe. But don't forget guys, instruction is instruction. So I have a different kind of PPE for you, which is how do we program adequately for virtual instruction? How do we plan for it adequately and have everything ready to go? And how do we then execute that plan, right? So in the next section, in part two, this is what we're going to be addressing at length. So um, at this point, what I'm going to do, my email is here, by the way. So if anyone has any additional questions, even after the session, you wanna contact me, please feel free um, to email me uh, at this email address. But at this time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that you don't have to see my teeny picture. And then I'm going to go back to the chat and see if there are any um, specific questions. So I'm hoping um, that the audio issue got fixed. Uh, so I'm hoping everybody muted themselves and that's all good because I, I couldn't even see the chat when I had my presentation up. Um, as far as uh, the Zoom sessions for this, if you're referring to, if you're in this session, should you be at all three? This session was intended to be delivered in three parts so that whoever is in this session would be participating in all three strands. That's the intent of it, because one is a continuation of the other. So in the next section, we're going to be addressing a lot of the planning of the instruction and some of the problem behavior issues, and I'll even share a few videos with you on how you, um, what some of those um, uh, addressing problem behavior, some of those techniques are that we can use to train um, parents. However, if for some reason you miss like part three or whatever, then you can always access it because it will be on Schoology as you saw. All of the sessions are recorded. Um, thank you for whoever answered about the earbuds. Let's see. Okay, here's one. How do you suggest supporting these students when the caretaker at the time is not able to assist the students? So that is an absolutely excellent question. It's probably the biggest confound, right, that we have. And I'm just going to present this to you. Please know I'm not trying to stir the pot for any teachers, but I'm just asking that you hear me out, okay, because the reality is we're faced with very unique circumstances and we keep hearing the word unprecedented, but that's an understatement for what we are in right now. Whatever your beliefs may be on everything that is happening. But the bottom line, these are students who need us desperately. And so maybe your teacher day is, you know, eight to 3.15, I'm gonna make this up, okay? And you may have a family member that's not available at that time, but available at five. There were teachers who contacted their administrators and said, are you okay if at the time I would be teaching this child, I would take a break so that instead I could log on with them later on. So I think this calls for um, an amount of flexibility and I'm not trying to tell anyone what to do or you know, to each their own in decision making, right? But I just ask that you consider flexibility because what families are facing is unreal, including some of you. So I even had some teachers share with me, actually it turned out to be ideal for me because what wound up happening was I had to get my child on with their teacher at this time and it allowed me to be free. And I know teachers who ran sessions in the evenings on Saturdays instead of during their time, but then they just swapped it out, you know, and they would have more free time, of course. I would never say something like that without telling you, talk to your administrators, make sure you know that everything is okay and that you're okay with it and you're able to do it. But I think it's worth sharing that because there are realities, guys. There are many, many, many students out there who never got taught in virtual instruction. And I think we need to be aware of that. And if we're going to say we're going virtual, then how can we develop plans that include flexibility to allow these families to access 
their child's education. You know, in some cases, families were given the option, in others, they haven't been given the option. And for some families, keep in mind that telling them their child has to wear a mask all the time, they may perceive that as not having the option because they may be thinking, there's no way I can't, you know, it took me the entire summer to get my child to wear a mask for five minutes. It's not going to, um, um, how are they going to keep it in school? They're going to get kicked out. So just don't forget guys, individualized education plans. Don't forget team decisions, specially designed instructions for these cases. Speak up, speak out. You are the advocates for these students. So we are the ones who have to advocate for them and say, but here's my circumstance. Yes, we'll be addressing this in school. However, it may take me this long to teach this child to even put on the mask. So make sure you are, um, you are addressing those things. Um, school, my school will have teachers record their lessons so that the parents can view it later with their child. I think that is fantastic. I actually am going to be talking about parent training and that is one of the options. Of course, you just have to make sure that there's agreements, that there is you know, mutual um, respected boundaries, if you know what I mean on all ends. But the power of, you know, one of the best things I learned from this whole virtual fiasco is how much we empowered so many parents by being able to train them virtually, by sending them videos. So I actually think that is um, a wonderful thing now. If what you're saying is teachers are recording the lesson for the parent to view it with the child and there's no teacher student interaction, I'm actually going to address that in detail. That concerns me a little bit more, but I'll give you the workaround if that is your only option because the, the district, that's what everybody's doing. I think that becomes um, a, an extreme detriment for many, many of the students that that you serve because we know that the parents aren't necessarily equipped to be able to address how to teach them, how to correct them, how to manage problem behavior, et cetera. So I will talk about that, okay? Um, and then it says, parents are frustrated that the kids are expected to learn effectively by watching a video. Um, anybody who knows me knows that I say it like it is and I'm gonna say it like it is here. And by the way, I know it's 12 o'clock, so anybody who wants to take their break, whatever, is welcome to leave. I just said I'm going to stay available to everyone because I'm okay, I don't need a break, um, and I think this is too important for me to be getting up to get water, so I'm gonna stay here with you. But here's the deal, I am going to talk to you with my heart on my sleeve. Um, I was one of the first parents who said, if you expect you know, to tell me that sending a video home for my child to do an activity substitutes the dire instruction, you know, that they so critically need, this isn't, this isn't happening. Like it's not, I know for my children, it doesn't work. It might work for others. But when you think of level learners that require direct instruction, guys, it's bad enough. I'm just saying like, this is something we may have to sit back down with administration and say, here's our concern. It's bad enough that already students in desperate need who had dense instruction throughout the day. So they may have had several sessions, right, throughout the day where they worked with a teacher. And now based on the virtual setup, maybe they'll have one or two sessions if we're lucky with you. Already they've lost how many sessions of instruction. And then on top of that, we're sending a pre-recorded video. What's the outcome of that going to be? Um, Sorry, I just um, saw this that apparently, I apologize, um, I didn't sound loud enough. I don't know why. Um, I will try doing a test now and switching microphones. I know this is why, see, this is why I hate virtual instruction. <laughs> but um, does that sound better? Is that better for those who are here? Okay, so I'll use this one. I'll use this one for now. Andrea Borgman, you were about to say something. I was, I, yes. Your volume is much better, by the way. Okay. Um, so my district in, in March, April, we did live instruction, virtual live instruction all day, every day. But what I ran into difficulty with with my um, very challenging autistic population is the parents were busy, as you pointed out, they're working from home, they're trying to manage their children. So they would give them 
the iPad, the TV, whatever, to keep them occupied. So those used to be the reinforcements in school. They would work for a certain amount of time. They would earn the iPad. They'd work for a certain amount of time. They'd earn something else. But now they have those free range all the time. Do you have any, and I really grappled with um, how to address that with the parents because they were using that as their babysitting tool and I completely understood and I tried to be empathetic. But on the other hand, it didn't set up a conducive um, instructional learning situation. Um, do you have any situations for how to manage those behavioral reinforcements um, and or maybe what I could say to the parents? And there might not be anything I can say because really it is their babysitter, so. Absolutely. So um, first off, I will tell you um, that th that is a reality, you know, that we saw on many occasions. And that's why many teachers who had already gotten students to respond to them, et cetera, were having tons of problem behavior, even when they were doing instruction with them. So it's definitely a confound. And that kind of goes with getting an assessment of the current situations and then prioritizing. To me, for example, I'll just, you know, speak to your question and to you and give you some potential answers. What are two potential priorities for a child like that? Condition other things that may not be as valuable, but that could help them engage and entertain them because they're preferred, they might be preferred activities that they could engage in, but not as valuable as the iPad, that now you could still use, right? Those kind of things during your virtual instruction. So that's one. Second, would be prioritizing, you know, maybe for this learner, it wasn't determined yet that engaging in some independent activities where they could do something for a period of time would be something that would be prioritized by the school because maybe language was way more of a priority for this learner, right? So if that's the case, another thought would be, well, maybe now this is a priority and can we teach some very, very simple tasks that then you know, we can teach the parent to give a direction, much like when we teach independent tasks at school and we can tell the parent to say, okay, go do your bin, go do your tasks, you know, go do your work, go, do, go, go play your game, whatever we use as the verbal SD, that it would be consistent and that we can navigate parents through how to teach that. In our resources, Andrea, we do have some, um, specific instructions that we tailor for parents, but it was intended like for teachers to also use as training tools on, you know, how to keep your child engaged throughout the day, how to teach them to perform independent activities, how to structure the day. So those may be some helpful tools because, you know, in my humblest of opinions, when you have a situation like that, how are you expected to do anything when anything that could be potentially a reinforcer the child has access for free? So that's where it becomes such a need to train the parent on what reinforcement is, what it does for their acquisition, why you need it and need to use it and explain, this is what happens when you use it all day at home. Now, when I try to use it, when he's engaging in a lot of things that are really difficult, it's not effective at all because he gets it for free all the time. And, you know, trying to keep it simple, I'll address that in detail now. Um, I love that. So can I find some type that handout on the Batan website? That yes. Because mm -hmm. me just saying it doesn't, doesn't offer as much validity as if I give them a handout that maybe reinforces. And I'm going to throw this out there, you know, and I'm going to speak from the bottom of my heart. I'm not, like I said, to each man its own. Um, whatever you personally feel as far as how much you give of yourself, I don't judge anybody. I know everybody's very different in their circumstances. Some people have more limits than others. Some people, you know, have different values and stamps on what they give. I, I don't, I respect everyone's decision. But I want to throw out there, Andrea, I, I, you know, to you and to any other teacher, you have a parent that you think, you know, could benefit in terms of, I've gotten on, I don't even know how many times on Zooms with teachers to explain these things to parents, to speak from a parent perspective, to say, look, I know you have these confounds, so you know, we have available um, parent consultation and, and even if we don't provide support to your district, we are able, you know, for unique circumstances, if you reach out, look, I can't get instruction in place because of this, I could use some help with either parent training or, or talking to a parent, please do not hesitate to reach out. That's why we're here, you know, anything we can do to help support, um, children and teachers in their instruction. We know we're asking for a lot, you know, and, 
And, you know, I wish I could pay teachers a million dollars per day. They deserve it. And I wish teachers made what lawyers made. You know, I, I'm not going to lie. I have deep respect for teachers. But I also know this calls for um, a level of, of, you know, humanity and sensitivity that's beyond sometimes even, you know, just everybody pitching a little more, we might get farther. But again, please know that's zero judgment. I know teachers who have gone through depression and anxiety themselves throughout this. So please know, I say that with the utmost respect. You know, I'm not going, I'm not trying to tell you to do anything. That's why I preface that. So I wanna make sure you are aware of that. Um, Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Uh, link to the PowerPoint. Yes, everything is on Schoology. Uh, thank you, uh, Ethan, for posting that. Um, the login information should have been given to you for the Schoology. Um, uh, I believe um, Ethan already sent that link as well. And then as far as this session, the other two pieces to it, it's the same link and it is um, the uh, same password to get in. So even, you know, anyone who decides to log off, log back on, it is the same information you use across all the sessions, okay? So just so you know that, let me see. Is there a way to get an editable version of that chart? There is an editable version on the um, patent website. I can also um, gladly share the file here. Here, let me see if I can pull this up quickly and share it here, but it should also be on the patent website. Um, pulling it up now for you. Okay, here we go. So I am, oops, I just accidentally shared it privately here. <laughs> Let me do this again. Here we go. somehow changing to private everyone in meeting. And I'm telling you, when technology works, it's so great. Say that. Go back here. Sorry, this is just asking me to save something that I have no interest in saving. And so, okay, let me go back in here and get that for you. Okay, now this is going to everyone. So there you go. Um, you can just click on that link and it should open up, but it's also on our patent website. Um, let me see, I'm trying to see if um, there was anything else I missed. Um, um, thank you, Tanya, for sharing that. Um, about, you know, you had to work certain hours a day and your district paid extra um, for the extra hour that you had. Um, but, you know, I love your comment on is, you know, is it a little inconvenient to go above and beyond perhaps, but isn't that what we do anyway? I, that hits me like a dagger straight to my heart. Um, you know, kudos and to you. And again, that is no judgment for anyone who feels differently. Each person, you know, like I say to each man its own and with all due respect to everyone. Um, however, I do think these times, right? Um, unprecedented times call for unprecedented actions also. And so, you know, I, I personally try to um, model what I preach. I, I haven't taken a day yet since March 13th and I don't plan to as of now. Um, I'll take a couple, few hours tomorrow because it's my son's birthday, but really, you know, to be available for you and for parents and for anyone else. So, um, you know, no, our intention is only to help, not to critique or point fingers to anyone. Um, contact information, again, I will put my email right here for you. There you go. Um, and um, in addition to that, even if you go to the patent website, um, my name and my phone are there. So, you know, in my email, so you can contact me that way as well. Um, um, 
says, tech is why I can't send my kid to my parents if she wanted to save her to only go back on it because of the confound of, um, again, the whole technology piece, right? It says, um, I think it's important we remember that teachers are part of this collective trauma during these times. A work-life balance is more important now than ever. Um, value your perspective. Thankful you're open to all opinions on the topic um, of working late and on weekends. Absolutely, um, Sarah, I, I am so grateful for your comment and I believe that wholeheartedly, which is why I said, you have to look at your own circumstances as well. I don't say that lightly, right? Um, I, yes, I'm going to address um, how you would perform assessments or instruction virtually. Um, but what I meant by that is if we know, like if you know your circumstances don't permit, then reach out, you know, to your administrators say, look, I have this family and they absolutely have no access for this time. Administration may work something where maybe another teacher is available to help that family out. Like there's all, you know, people are being more creative than ever. And I think this is a time that calls for that. So, you know, I just say, try to be a little bit flexible in, um, in what you do and just communicate because I couldn't agree more. Like I said, I've had teachers fall apart, you know, excuse me, at a Zoom, and we know that that can be um, a big confound. So I will keep um, addressing questions in the, um, in the <laughs> thank you to whoever sent that. Oh, Mark, <laughs> happy birthday to Alexander. And yes, I already stocked up on candy corn for him for tomorrow. So um, I'm going to go ahead since it is 12, 18 and um, start the second part. Again, we'll do the same thing. I will keep on, you know, at the end, look at the chat. I'll leave time for questions. If for some reason this section is a tad bit longer, we don't have time for those questions now. We will address them then at the end of part three. Um, so I don't want to cut any corners for you, okay? So let me share my screen.